My name is Enes Kuktas, and I'm going to present our work, which is on uh, mitigating advanced code reuse attacks at the binary level. Uh, so I share the first authorship with Victor van der Veen, who's sitting there. So um, control flow integrity is a very promising technique to stop uh, code reuse attacks. What it actually is doing is en it enforces certain uh, constraints. Uh, so control flow integrity actually modifies the program such that it uh, enforces certain constraints during runtime, uh, which actually hinders the capabilities of uh, attackers. Uh, however, it is not that easy to enforce a very good uh, control flow integrity at, uh, in, in a program, especially at the uh, binary level, where you don't have the uh, information uh, that's available uh, in the source code. So um, existing binary level CFI solutions, uh, these are not able to protect, I mean, to prevent function reuse attacks, so the more advanced code reuse attacks. Um, this is called, so one of these uh, attack techniques is called COOP. So we developed type armor, which is uh, a binary level CFI solution, but a more precise one than the current state of the art binary <laughs> level solutions. Um, it stops all published code reuse attacks with an acceptable and comparable overhead of about 3% on spec. Um, so what we try to do is we try to get as close as possible to um, solu source level solutions. So, we try, so in source level solutions, they uh, enforce, um, they look at the types of functions and uh, they use yeah, certain information and we try to get actually close to this uh, solution. So let me try to give you an idea of what advanced code reuse attacks are. So what are attackers doing in such advanced attacks? Uh, so here we have a piece of code, that, a function that contains a while loop, which contains an indirect call. And this indirect call uh, uses the f pointer variable to call different functions. Uh, so at runtime, this f pointer variable is being loaded with the address of a function, and then uh, at runtime it calls this function, the loaded uh, function. And this can also be another function at the same indirect call. So it's not a direct call. It can be different uh, functions at different moments in program. Uh, but here, uh, we take three functions from the program. Uh, among others, um, we, take the f we take function one as an example. So this indirect call is allowed to call function one, but not function two and function three. Okay, it's not working. Okay, so what does an attacker do? The attacker gets control over this indirect call with some vulnerability. So it gets control of this F pointer. It's load, it's, it, it loads its own, um, the address of its interested function. For example, function two and function three. Um, so an attacker what an attacker does in this advanced code reuse attacks is it uses this indirect call within this loop to call multiple functions after each other. Um, so it also gets control of this uh, while loop, actually. And then uh, it calls multiple functions after each other to perform its desired functionality. The functions that perform the functionality are call, uh, we call gadgets, and the main uh, loop gadget uh, we call loop gadgets. And this is function-oriented programming. So, um, however, binary level CFI solutions, uh, they are unable to uh, resolve the exact targets of this indirect call. So they do raise the bar for attackers. The indirect call cannot go anywhere in the program, um, but to a limited set of targets, but to all uh, functions in the end. And this allows um, attackers to still perform the advanced code reuse attacks. So it's, it would allow this indirect call to go to all these functions. So at source level, um, you have all the information. You can um, extract the um, targets for all indirect calls, and you can enforce this information during runtime. For example, VTV enforces the class hierarchy information uh, to actually 
uh, enforce this uh, constraint at runtime, and it, this allows, for example, this indirect call to go to uh, un unintended locations like function two and function three. IFCC the same. However, this technique uh, enforces the, um, well, you leverages the function argument types available at source code. Uh, so what is type armor doing? So type armor tries to approximate the source level accuracy, tries to get close to the source level available information. Um, however, it is not as accurate as source, so it allows certain uh, unintended functions still. Uh, however, it does stop, um, it stops more than uh, the current binary level solutions. So it, for example, it stops for uh, the, th the third function, function three. Uh, so, we, so we are somewhere in between the current state-of-the-art solutions and the source level solutions. Okay. How do we approximate the source level accuracy? So what do we extract from the binaries? We perform uh, function signature matching by extracting um, argument counts at the indirect call sites and the functions. So at the indirect call sites, we do some analysis and we get, uh, we look for arguments being prepared and, that we, and we use that as the invariant at the indirect call side. And we do a similar thing at the functions where we look at arguments being uh, used. Um, and then once we have this information, we mark the indirect call sites and the functions uh, with the argument count and then we perform some matching. So only, uh, Functions that match with indirect call sites, uh, only these are allowed to be uh, performed during ground time. So let's give an example. Assume that we have an indirect call site and type armor uh, determines that it prepares two arguments. Uh, then this indirect call site is not allowed to call functions that actually expect uh, three or more arguments. We have implemented type armor for 64 bit architecture where the calling convention is that the first few arguments uh, when a function is called is given through registers. So when we do the analysis at the indirect call site and the functions, um, we look for instructions that, so for the, at the indirect call site, we look for instructions that actually write to these register arguments. And at the, function, at the functions, we look at instructions that um, read the, in, the, the register argument before it is written. So it, uh, uses the value uh, that has come in the function. Okay, so um, let's give an example. So uh, we match, once we have the uh, information, we match um, the, the call sites and the functions and depending on the, the types, we either allow or disallow the uh, link. For example, at this uh, indirect call site, type armor uh, determines that it prepares two uh, arguments, and at, the, at function one, it also determines that it expects two arguments. Uh, type armor would allow this uh, link to be performed. The same applies for function two, where type armor determines that it actually also uh, expects two arguments, uh, and it would allow, again, uh, the the link, the control flow from the indirect call to this function, function two. However, at function three, it determines that it expects three arguments, and as a result, type armor, um, this allows this indirect call to go to function three because the matching uh, didn't succeed. So how accurate can we determine the prepared and um, the uh, the used argument count at in our call sites and the functions. We have uh, evaluated uh, some widely used applications, servers, including Memcached, LightTPD, Nginx, and MySQL. Memcached is a distributed server, uh, mem uh, memory cached, uh, that performs memory caching. LightTPD, Nginx are HTTP servers that uh, serve websites, and MySQL is a database. The first three servers are C programs. MySQL is a C++ program. And you can see that MySQL is actually 
well, a lot more complex. It, it contains lots of inner calls and lots of other staking functions. Uh, we, we can notice actually that we get quite close to the source code in determining the argument counts. For example, for MySQL, we can determine, well, type argument determines that, finds that uh, about well, close to 6,000 uh, call sites. Um, so it's able to determine precisely the argument count for 6,000 uh, call sites out of 7,500. And for functions, it is uh, able to determine precisely for about 7,000 out of 10,000 uh, functions, the argument count that it, it expects. So um, once we have this information, how do we um, uh, en enforce it during runtime, like uh, the matching? We insert checks before the indirect calls, and we insert the IDs, which are the expected argument counts uh, at the functions. Uh, we, we insert it before the uh, function entry point. Once the indirect call is about to be called, it performs the check. It retrieves the ID of the, the, the function that's targeted, and then it performs a check. This check does, um, is the ID of the targeted function within my reach? And that is, uh, it checks whether the target ID is less or equal to its own ID. So in this case, this indirect call could go to functions that have zero, one, or two uh, arguments. So we also performed um, uh, some performance e evaluation uh, to compare our solution with the others. And um, we performed the performance evaluation on spec, where we uh, had, well, acceptable performance overhead less than 3% in geometric mean. We again evaluated some servers and um, here we could see that actually security comes um, with a price. So improved security can, uh, can give actually also quite some performance overhead. We saw in MySQL, which is our worst case uh, performance overhead, which is in C++, um, had a performance overhead of 24%, but the others had uh, far less uh, performance overhead. And we think that MySQL um, executes an uh, immense amount of uh, indirect calls in its critical path. As to conclude, we extract new invariants from binaries that were not evaluated before, extracted before, and we use this information um, to apply the strictest security policy at the binary level known to date. And we actually also show that binary level CFI solutions can mitigate uh, advanced code reuse attacks. Also, we are planning to uh, make Type Armor open source, so keep an eye out on our webpage, vusec.net. Thanks for listening, and I'm happy to accept questions. <laughs>
uh, itself. I'm not sure if it's address taken, but the program itself can have a printf-like function which can be address taken. And uh, for such functions, for uh, functions with variable variadic arguments, we do some pattern matching. So you have this specific um, uh, piece of assembly in such, arg in, in such functions. Um, and then there you can extract, you can see how many are actually exactly set, and then the rest is variadic. And then we take this um, exact uh, argument count that we can detect there. Okay. I think he asked my question already. All right, so Vasil Kimmerlis, Brown University. Um, so when you identify arguments, you rely on the fact that you know the calling convention, which is x86-64 and which arguments parse in registers and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. How do you handle static functions? How do when, I a handle? when a compiler compiles a static function. Static function. Yeah, and a function that is not exposed in a compilation unit. There is no requirement to respect the calling convention. So how do you identify the arguments there? In some um, cases. So, in static functions, so which are not address taken, you mean? Or I think I. You can have static functions which are address taken and are assigned to function pointers. Okay, what's the problem you're seeing there? So, the problem is that how do you know uh, you rely on the calling convention to identify the arguments, right? Mm -hmm. And the compiler, when it compiles that, doesn't need to follow the calling convention can do whatever it wants because the, the function is not exposed outside of the compilation unit. Mm. So I think if it is address taken, I don't think the compiler can do whatever it wants, I think. Oh, we, we, OK, we will have a look at it. But I think if it's address taken, it has to follow rules that apply to address taken. So I think that priority is higher than if it's okay. address taken. All right, thanks. Okay. Hi. Uh, so I have another question. Uh, does your tool handle? calls based on the register-based uh, register calls when the address is in the register, not in the memory. Compiler can do those kind of things, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I think I couldn't understand. So the, the example that you showed, yes. uh, it was a call F pointer. So yeah. F pointer is holding the address of the call. Yeah, exactly. But there are certain situations in which compiler uses register-based calls. It, it uses yeah. the registers to make a call. Yeah, so yeah. do you okay. address those yes, things? Yes, so it? during the binary instrumentation, we take the, uh, so we look at the call, the mm -hmm. indirect call, and then we um, extract the target um, based on what, so how the call is making the call, actually. So if it is a register, we get the address from, I mean, the value of the register. If it's a dereference on the register, we also dereference that register to get the target. Okay, so in the, at the part of the tool analysis, you make sure that if it is not an indirect call based on the memory, then you actually try and look for if it is making a register-based call. Yeah. Okay. I have a couple but of other questions, but I'll take offline. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, hi, I'm Nathan Burrow from Purdue. I was curious, your tool relies on function signatures, do you have any insight into how many functions in a program have the same signature according to your tool? And if that group mm -hmm. is large enough to still make code reuse attacks within that group of functions with the same signature practical? Okay, that's a very good question. Mm. <laughs> um, no, I don't have to answer right now. But <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I, I, I noticed you mentioned in your abstract a little bit about uh, the, the coup attack. Um, do you, can, can you talk a little bit about why your, why your solution, since it's still not fully precise, uh, mi mitigates that attack? I, I guess I just don't understand that, that link there. Why it does not mitigate? Why, why it does mitigate. You, you had a blurb in your abstract, and, and maybe I should just oh, read yeah. the paper, but, but why, like what, what's the okay. interaction between yeah. this, this additional precision and, and the coup attack? Mm -hmm. So during the coup attack, it uses the main loop, the loop gadget, where it has one indirect call site, and it calls different functions, right? Okay. Okay, so we look at the indirect call site, and we, so um, in the examples we, uh, so in advanced code trees attacks we looked at, we could see that uh, the uh, indirect call that was used in the main loop did not match with at least one of the functions that were called. 
So in that way, we could stop the attack. Um, so, so you, to, to be clear, you were just looking, did you, did you look to see if like, the, there were other functions that were still allowed under your scheme that could have replaced the ones that were used in the coup attack? Mm, no, we didn't look at the, to, to, to harden the available exploit, we didn't have a look at it. Okay.